On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar conference titled Health Literacy and the Building Blocks of Web Design. My name is Kathy Reynolds, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Megan Shetterly is a Senior Patient Safety Liaison with the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. Megan has worked for the authority in the capacity of a Patient Safety Liaison since August 2008. Since this time, she has worked with various Pennsylvania healthcare facilities in an effort to reduce medical errors. She has given multiple educational presentations and written our advisory articles on various patient safety related topics. She has facilitated collaboration efforts with healthcare facilities in order to improve patient safety with projects focused on blood specimen labeling and preoperative screening. She is a certified professional in patient safety, certified in just culture training, and a Team Steps Master Trainer. Sean Kincaid is a Service Information Developer 3 with DXC Technology, who has partnered with the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority to provide design and development services for the authority's public website and the patient safety reporting system. Sean has over 20 years of experience in design, development, and support of web and client user interfaces and applications for manufacturing, federal, and state government clients. Uh, Megan, I'd like to now turn the program over to you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, today, this is actually um, a fourth in a series of four webinars for health literacy. And today, Sean and I are going to cover three topics. We are first going to talk about health literacy and its impact. We're second going to talk about some barriers, some challenges that confront us with health literacy. And then third and probably most important, important is the core of our program where Sean is going to talk about web design strategies that are really most effective in communicating health information to all levels of health literacy. So what is health literacy? Health literacy really is the ability to read and really communicate in any fashion to understand and not just to be informed and not just to educate, but to understand. And then thirdly, to act on health information effectively so that people have takeaways, they're able to act on that effectively after they learn and understand the information that's given to them. So let's just talk a little bit about functional health literacy. It is the ability to apply reading skills or communication but it's also the ability to apply numeracy skills in the healthcare setting, and what is that? So let me just give you an example. If someone has to make a coordinated appointment with their healthcare provider, they have to be able to read a calendar and to tell time. In a more complex way to look at that, you may have someone who's a parent who goes to the pharmacy to pick up an over-the-counter medication for their child they would have to be able to figure out the dose of that medication based on perhaps the child's age or the child's weight. So those are some of the things to consider in health literacy. So throughout this webinar today, Sean and I really want to make this interactive. And so what we would like to do is to ask you some polling questions as we're moving throughout um, the first one that we have is uh, a two-part question, so if you could go to your compu uh, computer, we'd appreciate it. The first question is, in your current role, are you involved in your organization's literacy, health literacy efforts? And it's for any type of interaction between patients and families and healthcare staff. So your choices are yes, no, or don't know. The second part of this question is that if you answered yes to the previous question, do you have input into your organization's web design? Because that's really what our program is about today. So your answers or your choices for answers would be yes, no, or not applicable. So while we're waiting for you to answer that two-part question, I wanted to move on to what is the approach that you should take with regards to health literacy? Well, what they say is to take a universal approach and structure the delivery of care as if everyone may have what they call limited health literacy. So they say that you can't tell by looking at someone if they have limited health literacy. So for instance, you may have someone who um, dresses well and is very well spoken, 
So really camouflages um, their limited health literacy. You also may be encountering a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or someone with a PhD or anyone with an advanced degree, but they may not understand what's being spoken to them. Um, I would also ask you to consider that if you're a healthcare professional and you are the patient, that's a whole different perspective as well. And that person who is the patient may not understand what you're trying to communicate to them if you're using medical jargon that they're not familiar with, and keep in consideration that the patient is probably anxious or nervous or they're not feeling well. So we have to take all that into consideration. So really everyone benefits from clear communication. So now let us return to our question and the results. In the first question, we had asked if in your current role, are you involved in your organization's health literacy efforts for any type of interaction between patients, families, or healthcare staff? And it looks like the majority of the responses, 74% said yes. So that's awesome. So Sean, um, what do you think about that? Any thoughts? I think that's, a, that's a very encouraging, actually. It's good to know that uh, everybody's starting to get involved in this topic and starting to make progress in, in making this happen across the facilities. The second part of that question was, so if you answered yes to the previous question, do you have input into your organization's web design? And hmm, this is interesting. Um, input into the web design, no, I think was the majority of the responses at 45%. However, there's 29% of those on the call who answered yes. So any thoughts on that? Also not, expect, not unexpected. Um, we were kind of curious who was going to be on this call, how many were going to be uh, developer savvy, and how many were going to be uh, facility administrator. So that's kind of what I would expect to see. Yeah, agreed. We invited people like marketing and um, IT people or information technology, those who were educators, clinical people who all may have some hand or involvement in um, the web design, um, but those are interesting results. So let's talk a little bit about the scope of health literacy in our nation. So the first thing I want to show you is there's, there's going to be four levels of um, health literacy that I'm going to show you. The first is proficient. Twelve percent of our nation have proficiency, the highest level of health literacy. And an example of this is that you might find information required to define a medical term by searching through a document or perhaps searching on the internet, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, the second level of health literacy that we see, 53% in our nation have intermediate. And here's an example of intermediate. They can determine healthy weight range for specified height based on a graph that relates height and weight to body mass. And then the next level of health literacy is basic. Um, this is a person who can give two reasons why a person with no symptoms should be tested for a disease based on what they read in a pamphlet or perhaps on the internet if they're using it. And then the last level or the lowest level of health literacy is below basic. And this is a person who might be able to locate or and circle medical appointments on a slip. And that accounts for 14% of our population in this nation. And to put that in perspective, if you look at the title of this slide, 93 million adults have basic or below basic health literacy. And if you look at the pie chart, there's 14% at below basic, 22% at basic. So 36, almost 40% of our nation have basic or below basic health literacy. So certainly some opportunities. So let's filter this a little bit further and look at the extent of health literacy with regards to those adults age 65 and older. They have lower average health literacy than adults in younger age groups, and really this is a big deal. We have a growing number of people in that 65 and older age group, and typically people who are 65 and older usually have at least one health problem, if not more, that they're dealing with. And I would imagine that they are seeking out sources for their health information, one of them probably being the Internet, and we're going to show you those statistics in just a minute. And then coupled with the fact that as they're aging, they have some limitations as a result of some age changes, which impact 
their ability to read or communicate, to understand and act effectively on health information. So what's the cost of all of this? And there's a number of bullet points on this slide in front of you, but first and foremost is really the cost to the patient. Patients can endure pain and suffering. There can be disabilities, whether it is temporary or permanent, up to and including death. And so those are things that we need to consider in terms of health literacy and the way that we communicate with our patients because certainly there can be medical errors that occur as a result of that and or people may not seek medical care because they don't understand um, the need to do that. There's also a cost that's associated with healthcare facilities. Certainly healthcare facilities are experiencing um, probably longer lengths of stay um, as part of the cost of limited or low health literacy readmission of patients and poor outcomes um, of those patients who may have a lower or limited health literacy. So that really impacts them in terms of finances, in terms of um, their resources, and in terms of perhaps their reputation as a facility. And then at the bottom of the slide, you will see um, there's a cost to our society and to our nation as a whole with regards to our economy and monies uh, because of limited or low health literacy. And the estimated cost is, is between $106 billion to $238 billion annually. And I was looking at Vernon, which is one of the sources in the articles that we used for this, and to put that into perspective, he said that that makes up about 7 to 17% of what we're spending annually on health care. So again, some opportunities. So they recommend the steps that we should take is use living room language. And I think throughout all of our webinars, we've talked about that, to try to steer clear of medical jargon, use living room language with our patients and our families, make it simple, make it clear, make it to the point. So, I have another uh, polling question to ask you, so if you wouldn't mind going to your computer. The question is, does your organization have a protocol for web design that addresses health literacy? And your choices are yes, no, or don't know. So as I was talking about earlier, there is a growing population of adults, as well as seniors 65 and older, who are using the internet or using their computer to go online to gain access to information. And in this slide, you can see that growing trend. Um, it does go up to the year 2013 when this study was done. And I can only estimate and anticipate that in 2017 that those numbers have grown. So we know people are using the internet, but did you know that people read 25% slower on computers? And I would like you to consider those older adults that we were just talking about. Again, a lot of age-related changes that may be going on with them and maybe may be processing information a little bit more slowly themselves, coupled with the fact that you are reading 25% slower on the computer. Also consider with the older adult population that they may have visual changes or decrease in vision as well as hearing and maybe some changes in their motor skills and the use of the mouse. And I think Sean's gonna talk about that when we get to his section. So going back to our question, does your organization have a protocol for web design that addresses health literacy? And your choices were yes, no, or don't know. 71% said don't know. So Sean, what are your thoughts on that? Again, not terribly surprising. Uh, it would be very encouraging if, if uh, people have already in, engaged their, their the facilities in, in developing their websites for health literacy, um, but this this reinforces the, the fact that this is something we need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and the people who are on this call um, may not be um, intimately involved with that process. That's true. So um, that might be understandable as well. So. All right, so um, at this point in the program, I am going to hand it over to Sean. Um, Sean is really going to talk to you all about um, making your website more user-friendly uh, for your consumers and your uh, patient population. Thanks, Megan. Um, first of all, 
the biggest part of creating a user-friendly website all comes down to a good design. Now, I don't want to trivialize this process because there's no way on earth I'm going to explain web design in 25, 30 minutes. So this will be a very high level, scratch the surface, but it'll give you some good ideas to look for, what to, uh, what to expect, how you want to rate your own sites, and how you want to work with your own IT groups. When we talk about design, we talk about uh, how, how the web page is laid out, um, how the pages flow together, um, how you get between the pages, navigation. Um, as well as what's actually on the page, the meat of it, as, and how you use multimedia to supplement the, the design. So we'll start talking about the design. Okay, so we're going to design. Some things to start thinking about making it user friendly is, is how uh, you don't want to make it too complicated. Um, you kind of want people to get there as quick as possible, um, as few clicks as possible. Um, you want to help guide them to where they want to go if it's not intuitive. Um, you want to write your content so that it's easily read and understood. Um, so you kind of want to target that sixth to eighth grade. That's, that's the, uh, the sweet spot for, uh, for understanding. You don't want to make things difficult to find. So you have to allow for a good search method. Um, if it's well laid out, you don't need a search. But if it's a big site and you have a lot of content, you have to have a good search engine. And you want to be able to present your search results in a meaningful way. Um, you want to have a nice, consistent look and feel. So throughout, the, you want to use a similar color combination. You want to have a standard navigational practice. Um, and you also want to, uh, uh, if you can, try to adhere to something called 508 compliance. Now, 508 compliance doesn't really apply outside of the federal environment. But uh, the 508 compliance is a rule that the federal government has that indicates that all electronic systems must be designed in a way that they are easily used by persons of disability. So. When we design websites, we try to include those rules because it allows for those disabilities to be accounted for. So again, we talk about the design. It's all about how it looks, how do you get around, what's actually in there, and enhancing it with multimedia. So let's start with how it looks. Let's start with the background. Um, some tips on, on, this is an important tip because I see a lot of examples of this. You kind of contrast this key. You want either dark on light or light on dark. And you, you kind of want to do, um, take advantage of that contrast level, as I said. You want to avoid patterns. Um, a lot, I've seen a lot of web pages, they have a really nice logo or they have a really neat picture as a background. But if your content fades away or is hidden by that picture, it's, it's, not, pro it's not productive to your website and the message you're trying to get across to your organization. So here's an example. We have a graphic on the left side. You notice that it's, um, the graphics on a white background, so it kind of sets it apart. It really stands out. You also see two examples of bad coloring. You really don't want to use, like for example, dark blue on red because the contrast doesn't doesn't uh, pop. You also don't want to use uh, different shades of the same color. Again, it may look good to you, but again, we're focusing on people who have trouble with these, these sorts of things. Um, another thing I want to mention right here is, is color combinations. The big thing is color blindness. You want to stay away from combinations of yellow, blue, and green because they're the most, those standard kinds of color blindness. Um, again, something to think about as you establish your initial design. So what about when you're, when you're putting your stuff, the, uh, the content, the actual text? Um, you want to use short sentences. You want to bulletize your lists. You want to have a lot of white space. Spacing is key for readability. You want to left justify it just like as if they were reading a book. Something else to keep in mind is, is uh, the standard formatting of the text. You want to use text with good color and size. Don't go too small. Don't go too big. Use a standard font. Don't be fancy. Um, you see in the graphic there, keep it simple. That is, that is also a, a rule to live by. Um, standard case letters, you don't want to no, reserve your bold and your italics and your all caps. Reserve those for uh, headings and uh, things you want to draw attention to. The next part of a good design is layout. Again, this is how all the pages are put together. Here you want to have the same similar design across all your pages. You want to use the same iconography. You want to use the same symbols. And standard navigation, you want to keep that all similar so that as the person uses your website, they get used to how it works. You also want to avoid distractions. Pop-ups and things like that tend to distract the user. And you also want it to load quickly. If you have a bunch of sections on your web page that, that load slower than others, the user, what the user sees is it looks like it's popping up. 
Now, some websites you go to, particularly uh, ESPN and the news, they uh, make a lot of their money from advertising, and you see those things pop up all the time on the sides. So as you're trying to read an article, these things pop up and push things around and it readjusts. That makes it very difficult to read and is a detraction for most people. And imagine the older adults. Especially the older adults. Yeah, they uh, have a, I can see them complaining about that a great deal. Um, you want to keep your main points at the top of every page. You, you know, say what you want to say at the beginning. You want to avoid scrolling down too much. Um, one topic that we use here, is a, this is the, uh, uh, evolution from paper to uh, the web is the concept of above the fold. If you imagine your web, your, your screen, your computer screen is the top half of a piece of paper. This is how you, where you'd want to present most of your information. If you're presenting a printed article, you want to put your important information at the top of the page. Well, it's the same thing with a web page. You want to put all your information at the top of the page before the fold, and you would have to scroll down beyond the fold to see the other information. So you kind of want important stuff at the top, rationale below. And we call this an inverted pyramid writing style. Let's show you, as uh, Megan had mentioned, that we worked with the uh, public website uh, redesign in the past year. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of all these topics using that website. Okay? First example I have to show you is our home page. Now, you can go out to the website and see all of this stuff, but in the interest of time and speed here, it's easier to give you screenshots. Um, this is the home page. As I said, it's our look at the visual table of contents, for lack of a better expression. This is the only page where we have a lot of graphics. And because it's going to be the, the first page that grabs somebody's attention, this is where you want to present the main bullet points that you want to present to your, to your customers and clients. But once you get past that home page and you get into the details, you notice we kept the same color scheme, the same style. We introduced an, another menu on the left you see, but uh, that uh, same standard header across the top, same main menu is always going to be there on every page. We use the same colors, the same fonts, the same highlights on every page, and they all work in a similar way. Another example in a different area. Again, similar colors, similar color scheme, similar font style all across the board. Simple, consistent. Here's a good example of where we used a lot of white space. Okay, let's talk about navigation. Navigation is how you get around your website, not just on a page, but also between pages. One thing that a lot of people use, you want to use uh, the pull-down menu sparingly because that is difficult, for, especially for the aging to use. It, it takes um, a great deal of dexterity, especially with a mouse, um, to get the, the pull-down menus. It's nice to have nice, big areas for them to click on. It makes it easy to get around, it makes them just select what they want. Again, you want to minimize the amount of scrolling. I kind of mentioned that, keeping, keeping stuff, uh, the important stuff at the top so they don't have to scroll very far. And when you do use your buttons, make sure they stand out. Make sure they're big enough to click on. Um, make sure, one thing we were talking about earlier was the, uh, the migration away from web pages or computers into touch screens. And touch screens, especially with the people with, with dexterity issues, have trouble poking the right area. Now, the younger you are, you know, the smaller the buttons, we all like that, but like I said, as we get older, it's kind of harder to see the button. You need to make sure it's, it's nice and big, easy to click, and get, take the person where they want to go. I think that's so important because um, just the other day myself, I was on the computer on a website, and uh, to navigate, you had to actually click on the, uh, there was a picture that you had to click on, but I wasn't sure if you had to click on the picture or there was a separate link that you had to click on to navigate through. So it can be very confusing. So making that evident, I think, is so important. That's a great example of uh, the way they use the media, which was, may have been good or bad. But there's some other things, and I'll mention that later, is uh, how you effectively use media for things like links and things. That's a good time, good, good comment. Also with navigation, um, providing a site map is a good thing. Now this is primarily recommended for large websites where you have a lot, a lot of information. Um, it, it allows search engines to find stuff faster, index it, so if we need to go to Google, it indexes your site faster and it'll be able to, to present your information to people who are searching from their uh, search engines. You also want to include contact information. You always want to have somebody able to, if somebody wants to come and talk to a person, don't rely on, on them getting every, all the information they need from the site. Um, they may have just enough information to say, hey, I know this, these people know the answer to what I'm asking, but I'm not quite getting it from the page, so let me call somebody. So that's a great, great addition to all websites. Yeah, and I just wanted to say also, I think people 
look for that. Even when you have um, a business type website, there's a space for chat. Some people like to chat back and forth. Now, I don't know if it would be exchange of you know, medical information, but there are portals that you can go to that are secure portals where you can have an interactive um, session with someone at, at the other end. Not everybody offers that, but something to consider as well as a phone number for somebody to actually call and talk to. I think that's so important. That is a great addition, yes. Um, the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, we utilize the uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts. We have those on our integrated into our websites. Again, to tell, ask a question, post a question on, on our social media sites, and somebody will get back to you. So, yeah, that's another good idea. Um, part of navigation, and another tip to use is uh, expand your hyperlinks. For example, here's an, here's an example with click here for more information. If you, if you make just a click here, as opposed to click here for more information, the click here for more information is more descriptive. It tells the user what's going to happen. It doesn't leave them hanging with just click here. Oh, why? What's going to happen? I'm not sure. Where am I going to go? Do I have, a, you know, that sort of thing. So it's nice to, this also helps it stand out for people with touch screens where they've got more area to click on, to touch, where they're, they don't have to be quite as precise with their, with their fingers. So let me show you a couple of examples of navigation. Again, to go back to our home page, and on our home page we have our main menu. And again, this is on every page, but our main menu has, this is our only drop down. Um, that's because it was the most effective way to put navigation in such a way that you can limit the number of clicks to get to a destination. So almost everything you can get to on the, on the website is available, and, and I think we got ours down to two clicks. Um, there might be the rare three, but it's not, it would be internal information only, so the public information is all within two clicks. So. This is available on every page, as I said. And the other example I show you here is an informative hyperlink. This is where, the, if you'll notice, the caption under each of the pictures, the entire verbiage is the link. So it, it's, it gives the more area for the user to click on. It also allows the user to kind of zoom into the area without having to click on a smaller spot. So like I said, it's all about giving, giving the user a target. The other example I want to show you is once you get into our website, into some of the topics, we introduce a um, left side navigation menu. These are the only types of navigation we have. We have across the top, the main menu to get anywhere. And once you get into a certain area, within that area, we have a navigation on the left side. And again, we use the same fonts, color schemes. It works exactly the same way, no matter what section we go to. So we stay, Christian, so we stay consistent across the board. So let's talk a little bit about content or what actually goes into the web page. We'll start off with your, your section titles. Um, you're going to break your, break your stuff into sections, and for each of those sections, some good examples to use for your titles are either an action statement or a question. And this kind of represents what the user is, what are they looking for, or what questions they might have. If you can just echo that back to them, it makes it easier for them to just scan through those titles, find exactly which one they're looking for, and then they have their information. Even when you're doing a search on the internet, I found this uh, myself. If you enter it in as a question, as the bottom example is here, um, I think people have similar questions that are being ans uh, asked, so it will pop up and you'll find what you're looking for, I think, a lot more easier than just maybe a title of something or just a name of something. Yeah, some people who are more savvy with uh, web searches can enter the exact keyword in the right order and they get what they're looking for. But for most people, that's exactly right. They tend to, and that's some of the suggestions I make to people all the time, is they're, they're, how, how do you find stuff, stuff so fast in, in Google and Bing? Well, just what, what's your question? Well, how do I find it? Just type that in. Type exactly what you're looking for, and that will get you there. So that's always been a tip I've given people, especially when they're, how do I do this? More about content is what you, how you write, your, write the, the bulk of your material. Remember I mentioned you want to, that sweet spot of that sixth to eighth grade? We also kind of want to refine that a little bit. On your, on your home page, the very first page, like I said, that's the table of contents. That's the, the welcome. Here's a few things you might be interested in. That you can kind of keep at the lower levels. It makes it easier for people to read them, find out where they want to go. Once you get to your content, then you can kind of raise the level a little bit because that's where the details are going to be. Again, you want to use a topical sentence and keep it short and sweet. You want to uh, get to the point as quickly as possible. Um, always, 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 living room language, very conversational. The goal is not to, to, to go over their head. You want to write it in a 
in a positive way. You don't want to don't avoid negatives. You want to tell them how they should do something, not why they shouldn't. Um, use graphics sparingly because if it's dis if it's distracting, it takes away from you the purpose of what you're trying to convey. Okay, I've got a couple examples of content for you. So, for example, I, before I go any further, we have two primary audiences within uh, the public website. We have a technical audience, which are primarily facilities and the medical professionals at those facilities. Um, the topics that go into our patient safety advisory are generally pretty high level. So this is an example of one of those technical advisories. Um, in a lot of cases, some of these are written at, at eighth, the eighth grade and up. And I say up because some of them are very detailed analysis and they get into a high level math, um, as you'll see. Now, I know this is tiny, the screen print is tiny, but like I said, you can go out to the website and check out any one of these. But for example, this is a, our technical audience, this is just the introduction to a topic. And you kind of see the content we're having there, just the, the bulk of the information to provide. Now, once you expand, each one of those gray bars expands areas in more detail. And for example, under this topic, under the results, if you expand it, you get a graph and a chart and some numbers. And, you, and if, if you're not fully versed in how, that's, how that all works, it's going to be a little confusing. So like, that's why I just want to demonstrate on our website, we purposefully have two different reading levels. So that was the technical side. Now, we also have information directly for patients. And this is written at, at a different level. This is all written explicitly to help the average patient with information that they may be looking for. For example, this is how you can prevent, how you can prevent medical errors. And we start off, we ask two questions. While you're at the hospital, I guess it's not quite a question, but while you're at the hospital, remember the following. While you're at the doctor's office, remember the following. Those are phrases they would hear every day. They would hear them at the, the, the breakfast table, at the living room language level. Again, keeping that all in mind, okay? So moving on to multimedia. Now multimedia, I, this is not just video, this is also uh, graphics and uh, audio, any kind of thing like that is included in this topic. You want to be very careful about the size of your material. Um, if you make it uh, too big, it takes a long time to download and it doesn't add very much in terms of value to the, to the consumer. Um, you want to make your graphics relevant. If, you have a, if you're talking about uh, medical errors, it doesn't make sense to have a picture of a car mechanic. As again, it kind of detracts and you kind of wonder, what's this about? And it kind of takes away from the validity of what you're trying to say. Video is another thing. It's got some, some, uh, some challenges. Um, video comes in many, many different formats. Is it compatible on the server? Is it compatible with the browser? Does it work on this website? How hard is it to play? What are the internal controls like? Are they easily seen, used, capable? Um, audio, can I hear? Is it clear? Is it garbled? Is it distracted? Is it too soft? Is it too loud? All those factors all go into whenever you're doing multimedia. So it's, it's, it's critical that you kind of do it in the right way because if you do it wrong, that's bad. You also want to make sure you include text alternatives to all of that. And that was one thing that um, Megan brought up earlier about having a, a picture as a link. That should also have a, if it's done right, a picture with a, as a link should also, when you hover over it, should also have a little pop-up in text that says exactly where that's going to go. Also, if you have a screen reader for the uh, side visually impaired, they can't read, if they have a screen reader, that picks up those text things. They can't see your picture. It was useless to them anyway. But it will read it to them what that text is and where they're going to go. So that's how they select it. So again. Just elaborate on that a little bit. Um, you were saying that if the file size is too big uh, or too hard for that person to get it to play because it might be streaming or what have you, um, that person may just navigate away from that page and just get frustrated. So it should be a somewhat smaller size. Yeah, because if they see a missing or a little icon, broken icon error, it's like, oh, well, that didn't help me at all. And instead of waiting for it, they may give you three to five seconds. That's nowhere near long enough to download some of the bigger files. So they're gone, long gone before they ever get something you worked long and hard on building and putting together. So I do have an example of how we did it with the Patient Safety Authority. We utilized a, uh, it's a really rare, it's a website that people have never heard of. It's called YouTube, right? Nobody's heard of that? Well, we took advantage of, uh, well, Google knows how to do it best, so we took advantage of their tools. Um, we just, all of our videos are hosted on YouTube, so we don't have to worry about hosting them, the size of them, the um, storage. 
We also don't have to worry about the, the, um, the playability controls because they've already figured it out. All we've done is link to their website, and they provided it for us, is you know exactly how to play that, that website just by clicking on that arrow. And for example, this is uh, the first in the, series, in the webinar series of health literacy. It's on our website now. Mm -hmm. Just as this one we're, we're recording right now will be out there later. Mm -hmm. You want to take advantage of stuff that you've put a lot of hard work and effort into. And just because you have 50 people listening to a particular webinar, just because they couldn't make it, by posting it on YouTube, we're allowed, anybody can see it at any time and they can share it with anybody. So, and yeah, just because we're the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, that doesn't limit us to anybody in the United States from sharing the file. So like I said, this, this is how we do it in ours. You, like I said, it's a YouTube link. You can, most people know how to get to YouTube. They can find it. We actually talk about subscribing to our channel and the instructions to this webinar. So that's a good example of how we're using multimedia. Okay, I'm going to turn this back over to Megan to talk about some websites that might help you to achieve some of your goals. Thanks, Sean. So now you all know why Sean does what he does, <laughs> and he's our go-to person, and he's excellent at explaining it, so thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I want to talk about um, some examples of some senior-friendly websites. You should have all received these in your um, information that Shelley had sent out to you prior to the webinar. If you don't have these, uh, Kathy is going to give you information at the end so that you can access that information. But in front of you, you'll see, uh, probably on the left-hand side of your screen, there's information there from um, the National Institute of Aging on a senior-friendly website. And on the right-hand side, um, there's one. It's the uh, American Foundation for the Blind. It's the AFB senior site, also uh, senior-friendly. But really, these can be adapted to any kind of uh, demographic or patient population. So just these are just some examples, and these are really some great examples. So we have more polling questions for you. Um, it's really just two more. So this is uh, one of two that we want to ask you before we finish today. Uh, we want to ask you, do you have a process to assess health literacy for your website? How do you know that it is user-friendly? Do you have a uh, process to do that? As Sean was just saying, we we're talking about that. So the uh, choices are yes, no, or don't know. Here's a link to some web accessibility assessment tools. And these are tools that are more high level. So um, these are things that you would probably forward or use uh, for people that are the Sean Kincaid's in your organization that are at a higher level looking at 508 compliance and um, design tools and accessibility and navigation um, that really is more at a higher level, but it is a great website um, for you to use for your web assessment. It gives you a great first step, too. This website has a really good, uh, it's a set of tools, actually. And they will actually scan your website and give you some feedback almost immediately about where you're at and what you need to do to get to a better presentation to your clients. That's even better information. They give you feedback. Fabulous. So um, going back to our question, and do you have a process to assess health literacy for your website? Yes, no, or don't know? 46% um, of you said don't know. Um, and there were 29% that actually said no, so they actually did give a response that they knew that they didn't have a process. So what's, what are your thoughts on that? I hope we can help that 29% yeah. said today. Um, for those of you that, that don't know if you have anything, it doesn't hurt to have more information to pass on to those people in your organization who would. Right. So to the, uh, to the yeses, fantastic. Yeah, so thank you for answering that polling question. Um, here are some other usability websites. Uh, these are more for, I guess I want to say, the average person um, to access and to utilize. Um, all three of these are very good sites. I've been on all three of them. But I think I'm just going back to, you know, that user testing and how important that is. And I just want to quote something because I, I found this as I was preparing for this webinar. And I'm telling you, I've learned so much more from Sean and from the things that I have read about web design and health literacy. But um, there was a developer of a website who said, user testing can be a humbling experience. There's an old adage in his community, and he says, you are not the user. And he worked, he said, a very hard time on a prototype that he thought was just perfect. 
city only to find that the person that tested it became confused. So again, so important for the consumers, the patients, the people that are actually using that website to go online and take a look at that. And um, one of my colleagues and I did a collaborative not too long ago where we're doing something similar, but it was with a paper format, um, and it was on um, pre-op instructions which was very interesting. We, we asked the staff at these facilities to take them back to their adult um, family members and take a look at it and ask them to read it and say, can you understand it? Does it make sense to you? Um, and all the things that we just said, can you read it? Can you understand it? And, and would you be able to act on it effectively? So these usability websites are great resources for you if you are interested, and all three are very good. So our very last polling question of this webinar is thinking about your organization's website. And given what you know from listening to this webinar, listening to Sean and I today and providing you with this information, on a scale of one to 10, with one being not handled at all and 10 being handled perfectly, how would you rate how well your website handles the topic of health literacy? If you don't have any knowledge um, at all of your organization's website, you can answer NA or not applicable. So again, um, the choices are a scale of one to 10 or not applicable. So while we're waiting for your responses, I just wanna go back to the references that Sean and I used for the presentation today for this webinar. There's a number, a number of references that we have listed. Uh, this, um, this particular slide gives a number of them, but there are others. Um, this slide, I have the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, listed at the top bullet point. I will tell you, all these resources are great, but this particular site gives you a lot of information, a full toolkit on health literacy that has a lot of really good information. The American Medical Association, the AMA, has been behind health literacy for some time and has some really great publications and information out there. And again, um, all of this, I'm not minimizing any of the other references on here because they're really all good. Um, Institute of Medicine, again, uh, really focused on health literacy, a lot of great information out there. At the top of this slide, the Healthcare Improvement Foundation was responsible actually for helping us to launch um, our, our, our program and getting on board with health literacy and educating facilities and healthcare professionals on health literacy. Um, and then of course, Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, we have a lot, as uh, Sean was pointing out, uh, educational tools, we have some interactive tools, as well as some advisory articles and other consumer tips for our, our patient consumers and population. And again, here are some additional references. So I'm going back to our question, thinking about your organization's website and given what you know from listening to our webinar today, on a scale of one to 10 with one being not handled at all and 10 being handled perfectly, how well your website handles the topic of health literacy. So let's see what the responses are. Um, 30% said not applicable, applicable, so maybe they are not aware. 17% gave a seven. Um, so those were the highest scores. It's a good bit that are a seven, seven to 10, so that's, that's encouraging. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so really we hope you walk away um, from today's webinar with more information um, than you had when you started. And by the way, please feel free to share this information with others in your organization. And if you are not the one who's responsible for web design or input into the web design at your facility, we encourage you <laughs> to step up and to um, offer your input. Thanks, Megan and Sean. That was a very informative presentation uh, that contained valuable information everyone can use in their organization. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. We have one question here I see thus far. Uh, the question is, this seems like a lot of work. For any given project, approximately how much extra time is required to achieve these goals? Sean, I'm gonna give that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of depends on when you start. Um, it's kind of like building a house. Um, if you incorporate some of this stuff early on in your building process, web design versus a home, 
um, it, it's much easier, it's much cheaper, it's much simpler. If you, if you can have a good design when you start building a website, then you're just building with the right tools as you go. But if you've already built half your, your site and you're retrofitting, you're backfilling it in there, that's a lot harder. Um, we always joke in, in software development about somebody, at, they're starting to build the second layer of your house and you suddenly decide you want a basement. Well, sorry, too bad. Um, it's kind of along those lines. Um, but to answer the question, um, if you start at the beginning, it really could only add 5% to a project. Um, but again, if you're going to retrofit because you don't know everything that's going to be impacted, it could be 25, 30% impact because it's not just that 5% to build the good design. Now you've got to disassemble what you've already put in there for, for color schemes, menuing, navigation, and put all this stuff in. And you put the new stuff in and maybe that's not compatible. You've got to change more and more and more. And suddenly it gets to be a steamroller. So it's kind of an open-ended question, but the, the point being is try to get address this kind of stuff as soon as you can. In, in the design process or your building process. Very interesting, thank you. And I see one more question now at this point. How can this type of effort be presented to management or administration who may not be able to see the return on investment of the development effort? That's a harder question to answer because yeah. it, it really comes in after the fact. Um, uh, I, I would almost say that they could almost do a business case as well because if we right. go back to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the slide that had the cost on it, and certainly you could do more investigation internally into your own facility and what you're seeing because if you're seeing readmissions, if you're seeing poor outcomes, if you're seeing um, increased length of stays, and you can revert that back to, you know, we've got a problem here with people really understanding the information that we're giving them and they cannot act on it effectively after they're discharged from our setting or even preoperatively before they come in for whatever reason there's, you know, something missing, then there is cost associated with that. And I think you can quantify that as well as do it qualitatively um, from getting feedback from patients even in, from your HCAP scores. Um, you know, because that's a big deal. So I, I think you can use that information to build your case, in my opinion. Oh, I, yeah, and as you mentioned, that that, that slide with the uh, costs on it. Yeah, all you got to do is present that to management. Because <laughs> that's, that's mm -hmm. all, it says it all right there. You can save a lot of money by putting this up front. You can, you can save your clients money, make it, make it more, more, uh, more beneficial to them because healthcare costs keep going up all the time. The more they know, the better they can manage their own their own health. Right. It's a reinforcement of information. Right. Yep. It's really a reinforcement of information. Because certainly, I'm sure they're getting it. Hopefully, um, to some degree. And, you know, we throw a lot of information at people in healthcare, especially when they're discharged from the setting. You know, here's paperwork and oodles of paperwork and lots of information coming at them. More than not, they just want to get home, so they're not really absorbing it. So, wouldn't it be nice if you could go out to a website afterwards? and have contact information to follow up with somebody if you don't understand something, but having some of that health information out there. And a lot of times you get that information Great. and it says, uh, contact us for more information. Well, take them up on it. If you have a question, give mm -hmm. them a call. Find it. Okay, there's another <laughs> question um, I yep. just saw here. It says, um, does the information today apply to uh, accessing a website via a mobile device or are there other considerations? Uh, across the board, generally, no, the considerations are the same no matter what the platform is. Now, if you look at, uh, at our website, I didn't, didn't go into this because just for, for time's sake. Um, when we design, redesigned the website, we did design it for every platform. We made sure that our color scheme, we try to keep it consistent across whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, laptop, or even a desktop machine. No matter what the size of your laptop is, or your screen, your screen is, we made sure that we did the screen, that the, the material presented fit the platform. So the, the design considerations are the same. You want to be consistent in your navigation, in your color scheme, um, your theme. That all stays the same. But your layout may be different. And also, this, the, uh, you may, for example, on those smaller sizes, the phone, uh, on a cell phone, we don't have anywhere near the graphics. It's just not worth the download, you know, and a lot of people, the big deal is about how much data you have. So we tried not to monopolize data, especially on the smaller devices. That was one design consideration that would change. 
Um, we did try to keep things smaller, quicker, load faster, so people on phones and tablets can kind of get to the information they're looking for. Yep, I just want to thank everybody for listening okay. today. And again, I would hope that you would pass this on to individuals in your facility that you think might benefit uh, from this information and from. Thank you again, and this concludes our webinar.